Thank you, Lee. Um, what a pleasure it is to be able to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Carl Dyseroth, today. Um, really one of the pioneers of mental health science, both a full professor at, uh, working in neuroscience at Stanford and a practicing psychiatrist um, at Stanford Hospitals. Um, it's, it's difficult to find somebody who can encompass both of those worlds quite as well as Carl does um, in looking after patients, treating uh, treatment of resistant depression, autism spectrum conditions, and at the same time, pioneering techniques to understand brain function through new and creative ways of visualizing and manipulating the brain. Um, one, of, one of the breakthroughs that Carl was responsible for, he's going to talk about in detail today, optogenetics, um, using careful genetic man manipulation to get exquisite sensitivity to stimulate um, brain, brains using light. Um, taking the things that we find every day in the back of our eyes, inserting them into brain cells and then doing magical things with them. Um, but actually he doesn't stop there if, as if one technical revolution in science is not, not enough. He's gone on to pioneer a method for clearing the brain. So taking brains that you can't see through and then making them transparent so that you can look at different um, brain cells in action. Um, and then most recently, uh, really exciting techniques where he can get living cells to create specific types of chemical materials. So you can take a brain cell and turn it into an electrical insulator or an electrical conductor. We're only just getting started on that. And that's really gonna be a revolutionary way of understanding the brain. Um, so these are the pioneering te techniques that Carl's produced. He's using them, they're now being used across the world and they're helping us to understand normal brain function as well as what, goes, uh, what, what can go wrong in cases of neurological and psychiatric disease. I will briefly build on that just to summarize the purpose of Carl's talk today. Firstly, showcasing and fostering a discussion of high quality mental health science, highlight cutting edge technological innovation that enables breakthrough in mental health science, and lastly, inspiring the next generation of leaders. So with that being said, we would like to welcome Carl to the virtual stage. Great. Thank you very much. It's really uh, an honor to be invited uh, to share my work and my experience. Um, as you've heard, I'm a practicing psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. And really what I want, I realize this is a very broad audience, people from all walks of life. And what I'd like to convey, I'll show a lot of science, but from a perspective that I think we should all keep in mind and the broader society should keep in mind, which is that there really is hope. We've really turned the corner on understanding mental illness, and that understanding will lead to new kinds of treatments. It'll reduce stigma. It'll help people understand themselves and each other. And this slide shows uh, an example of just how far uh, we can come. On the left, you see uh, what are single-celled algae with green flagella that let them swim through the water. And believe it or not, our understanding of how these single-celled algae work is now enabling us to understand the brain depicted at, at right and some of the highest level cognitive dysfunctions and psychiatric illness uh, uh, syndromes that you can imagine, including things as long mysterious and stigmatized as dissociation. What we see here is uh, a self-portrait from Andy Warhol, and you can see three different uh, aspects of him uh, simultaneously uh, depicted. And this is not too different from what people with dissociation uh, sometimes experience, and it can be uh, quite debilitating and distressing, but it's hard for them to get people to understand and appreciate what they're uh, going through because it's so uh, such an unusual and mysterious state. And what I'm gonna do is tell you how we can go all the way from those algae to understanding this state of dissociation. And the way this starts is, uh, with achieving control of brain cells using light. And this is something we've been working on for about 17 years. Uh, electrical and magnetic stimulation doesn't let you distinguish different kinds of cells. All cells are electrical in the brain, all neurons are, and an electrical or magnetic intervention will get all of them. With optogenetics, what we do is we take these little uh, proteins encoded by single genes uh, depicted in orange and blue down in the lower right. And these are single genes that we can put into single cells. They are light-activated regulators of ion flow across the membranes of cells. 
And what this allows us to do, because they're single genes, we can use genetic tricks to put them into one kind of cell or another. And these various forms of these little proteins uh, called opsins, they uh, bring negative or positive ions into cells. And negative ion influx in neurons usually means inhibition. Positive ions coming in means excitation or stimulation. And so now we can use light to control, turn on or off uh, individual kinds of cells uh, with high specificity and precision. These are beautiful proteins. I won't dwell on uh, exactly how they work, except to say that we've uh, come in my lab quite far in getting the high resolution crystal structures. This is the same X-ray crystallography method that allowed understanding of the double helix structure of DNA. What we've done here is look at these plant proteins in great detail, and we can understand how they work, and that lets us redesign them. We can get totally new kinds of function from understanding the high resolution structures. And marching down the middle of the slide, you can see we can get evoke, we can elicit these little spiky sawtooth-like deflections in the membrane potential, the voltage of a neuron. We can flash little pulses of blue light, membrane potential, drive action potentials, as they're called, at any speed we want, up to hundreds of times per second. We can use red light to do that as well. We can get long-acting excitation. We can even get inhibition, as the panel G shows. We can shut neurons down as well as excite them. And all this work was done with an incredible team of uh, students, postdoctoral fellows, and collaborators from around the world. Really uh, advanced high-resolution biophysics. Now, one thing this allowed us to do was then to uh, play in activity with great precision into the brains of living animals. We can even do this at single cell level in mice. Uh, what we see here, all the little red circles are individual neurons, individual brain cells that we've picked out in the visual cortex, the part of the brain that uh, is the first part in the surface of the brain, the cortex where visual stimuli, uh, uh, incoming information lands. And we can pick out individual cells and then we can use these devices shown at the bottom. These are called spatial light modulators. They make a hologram. They play in a hologram of light with many individual points of light. And we can guide those points of light to the individual red circles, the little spots of individual brain cells that we've uh, identified here and turn them on or off in synchrony, out of synchrony, in patterns involving dozens or hundreds of individual neurons. All the while, an animal is awake, alert, and uh, performing tasks. So this is such an exciting thing. You can imagine all the things that could be done. And we do this by using these tools from, from algae, from microbes. Now, what I want to specifically talk about is the dissociation question, because that really illustrates how far things have come. And here, uh, the students listed at the bottom, these are uh, were an amazing group of, of colleagues in the laboratory. What they did was devise a way to take a very broad brain-wide perspective, look all across the brain of a living mouse, and they built some optics that let them have this very broad perspective. And uh, I asked them to just, uh, you know, we didn't, we were unbiased. Uh, we were just taking a broad perspective. We wanted to see what would happen if we uh, delivered different uh, psychoactive drugs, drugs that altered people's uh, mental state, but now to a mouse. And so what we see here is a comparison. Saline is an animal that's just getting a salt solution, nothing special. But in the middle is ketamine. This is an animal that's getting this known psychoactive agent. It's known for causing dissociative effects. It also, uh, at, and, and under certain conditions, can cause antidepressant-like effects. And something was really stunning that popped out at us. And you can see it right here. In this central area near the bottom, the map at the right tells you which region it is, RSP, that stands for retrosplenial cortex. This is a patch of the surface of our brains that we share with all mammals. Mice have it too. And ketamine caused this uh, rhythmic pulsation of activity just in the retrosplenial cortex and, and nothing as organized anywhere else. So that was interesting. We did not anticipate that at all. It was very consistent. It came about between one to three times per second. Uh, very consistent. And it was only not only was it only in the retrosplenial cortex compared to all these other regions of the brain, as you can see here, but it was only caused by drugs that cause dissociation. More about dissociation in a moment, but known uh, drugs of abuse like PCP or other agents, MK801 uh, and ketamine, all drugs that are known to cause dissociation cause this rhythm, as the magenta bar shows, 
Other agents that are not known to be dissociative per se, even potent hallucinogens like LSD did not have this effect. So this seemed to be specific. It was only in these deep, what we call layer five neurons in cortex, L5 here. We use genetic tricks to just visualize the deep cortical neurons. It was not seen in the superficial layer two, three neurons. So there was incredible specificity, not only to one patch of cortex, but to one layer within that patch of cortex. And that was a consistent finding. Okay, now that now that you can see where what got us into this uh, path, uh, and we said this is you know this is a, an exciting part of science when you see something totally unexpected and you think well we've got to understand this. Let's talk about dissociation though, and this is uh, something that's extremely clinically important, not I would say widely uh, accepted or understood in the general public, and with good reason. It's very strange and and uh, very hard to articulate, very hard to understand. It's a state where normally integrated cognitive processes are uncoupled, are separated. Uh, and so a sensation might be disconnected from an emotional or affective response. Uh, you might have people still aware of body stimuli, but not caring, not feeling ownership of the body that even is experiencing pain. Of course, this can cause problems. Uh, and it's quite common. So it shows up across psychiatry. Uh, we see this very much in PTSD. Uh, we see it in the dissociative disorders, which have this uh, name. Uh, drugs of abuse can cause this. Borderline personality disorder, very common. Trauma. Uh, north of 70% of people who have trauma, who experience trauma, will have uh, dissociative experiences, and there's a lifetime prevalence of about 10%. So very common, uh, very poorly understood. And people describe this in various ways. Here's a quote from a patient with a dissociative disorder. If my mind is a car, I'm in the passenger seat looking at myself driving. Uh, someone on ketamine says, it's, it's like you're in the audience watching the movie of your life. P patients with epilepsy, uh, here's one who just before seizures, uh, the aura before a seizure, uh, said, I'm, I was listening to two parts of my brain speak to each other in a way that a third part of my brain, which I considered to be me, was able to listen. How interesting is that? And so we said, okay, how can we replicate this uh, in mice where we're doing these experiments? And so we said, as shown in the upper left, we said, okay, let's, let's separate stimulus detection from an affective or emotional response. And so we used a warm plate, uh, not, not hot enough to cause damage, just hot enough to be uncomfortable. And when you, uh, uh, the animal will, will reflexively withdraw its paw from that, and that's the stimulus detection, the reflexive paw flick, that just means they're awake, alert, and able to detect the stimulus. But then there's a more prolonged affective or emotional response, grasping the paw, licking it to cool it, and, and other uh, evasive maneuvers. And this is a very safe, well-tolerated, non-damaging, but lets us separate stimulus detection from an affective response. And what we found was that the, this separation did occur on ketamine. Uh, in the right-hand upper panel, you can see there was a dose of ketamine, 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram, where the affective or, emotion, or emotional response effectively disappeared, all the while the stimulus detection, the flicks, uh, the paw flicks to withdraw were still present. So this was very much like dissociation. The, the stimulus was detectable, but there was no emotional response. And by the way, those were the same doses where we were uh, able to see this oscillation appearing as well above 25 milligrams. So that all was uh, consistent. We saw that this rhythm, uh, as well as the behavior, were specific to dissociative agents. The behavior was uh, only seen with PCP and ketamine, but not a range uh, of other uh, uh, very potent psychoactive agents. And here uh, in the middle panel, uh, the yellow bar is PCP, another dissociative agent. And you can see how the emotional or affective response, the licks are abolished with PCP, but not with these other potent psychoactive uh, uh, agents. And we did a lot more basic neuroscience to understand how this works. I won't delve into it uh, in incredible detail just for the sake of time, but just to say we found a particular ion channels, one called the HCN1 channel that's present in these cells that if we knocked it out. We used uh, uh, very precise genetic tricks to remove it. And if we removed the HCN1 channel from this, these particular cells in retrosplenial cortex, the oscillation disappeared. So we knew that, that this ion channel, this protein that governs ion flow that's normally in the brain is involved and required 
to generate this ketamine-induced oscillation. And that also blocked the behavior. And this was pretty amazing. So this, we just removed this one little protein using genetic tricks, this HCN1 channel from this little patch of the brain, retrosplenial cortex. And that removing a channel abolished the ability of ketamine to cause this dissociative-like uh, behavior as well as the oscillation. So it did seem as though this, this oscillation was important, was required for the dissociative uh, effect to be seen. We also used optogenetics to provide the rhythm. So what I just showed you in the previous slide was taking away the rhythm and no longer seeing the dissociation. Here we used optogenetics to very precisely provide the rhythm. And we use that to just play in a particular pattern of activity using the same principles I described in the first slide to play in this, this rhythm uh, between one to three hertz. And when we do that, in retrosplenial cortex, as you see in this pair of plots in the middle of the, of the uh, slide, providing the rhythm, no ketamine present at all, just playing in this rhythm optogenetically, we saw no effect on stimulus detection, the flicks, the reflexive paw flicks, but we did see a, a quite significant reduction in the affective or emotional response, uh, uh, response to cool the, the, the paw. And that was not seen in other regions of cortex. SS here refers to somatosensory cortex. This is the region that mediates sensation. You would think that would be as likely to cause this as anywhere else, but it was really just in this retrosplenial cortex area where the effect was, was seen. So it seems as though this rhythm in retrosplenial cortex is both necessary and sufficient. Okay, so now let's come back to think about people for a moment. And here, I wanna tell you that uh, this patient who had this epileptic aura was a patient in our uh, Stanford uh, Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. And this was a patient who came in uh, with intractable epilepsy. So they were being routed through our surgical system to see, uh, could we help this patient uh, surgically with their epilepsy since drugs aren't working? And when, the way you do that is you do what's called stereo EEG. You put in many electrodes in the brain of the patient to listen all around and see where is the seizure starting? Where's the focus? So you can be as accurate and minimal in a surgical resection as possible, which of course you want to do. Well, we thought this was interesting. And so we looked at all the data coming from this patient's stereo EEG recordings all across their brain. During known dissociative episodes, this patient had a very consistent pattern of dissociation right before every seizure. And lo and behold, there was a rhythm it was one to three hertz, and it was in the exact homologous region, homologous to retrosplenial cortex in, in mice. There's a region in the back middle of our brains called the posterior medial cortex that includes retrosplenial, and that's where this patient's oscillation was uh, occurring. And it was only occurring during dissociation. So this <laughs> rhythm was in the right spot at the right time, and it was and during this patient's self-reported dissociation. And moreover, part of this clinical process is to stimulate electrically right at the site to see if you can elicit seizures, then you really know you've hit the causal site and that helps you in surgical planning. When our team stimulated this patient at these sites, dissociative symptoms were causally elicited at that moment by the stimulation uh, and only when stimulation was carried out in the regions that were capable of generating this three hertz uh, rhythm. And you can see this description number six in the lower right, that the patient gave this very, uh, uh, evocative description of being pulled out of the pilot's chair, still seeing all the gauges, seeing all the information flowing, uh, feeling separated from it, not able to control it, but still able to see it. So this really showed us we were on the right track and uh, this fits the overall picture of dissociation that we've talked about. A final thing then we said, hey, let's go back to the mouse. Let's use this knowledge. And can we come to a deep understanding of this state now that we know we're on the right track? And so we thought about wiring. We thought about what, what makes retrosplenial cortex special and how can we listen in in the same way in mice as we did in the people and with higher resolution. Now, this looks complicated. It's really not too complicated. This is some nice work from the Allen Institute looking at connections between cortex, the surface of the brain, and a deep uh, a structure called the thalamus. The upper uh, plot, top half of the slide, is all the connections from different parts of cortex to all the different parts of thalamus. And then lower half of the slide is all the connections coming from thalamus to all the different parts of cortex. And it looks complex, but if you look at retrosplenial cortex, you can see it's got some very specific wiring patterns. It projects 
to and from some thalamic nuclei regions like AV and LD, but not to others that are right nearby like AM. AM projects to other regions. And we thought, huh, this is interesting. If retrosplenial cortex is oscillating, then these regions that are heavily connected to it probably will too. They'll be entrained with it. And others will not be. And so you're going to end up having one part of cortex and one part of thalamus entrained to one rhythm. And then these regions that are not connected, but subserving other regions of the brain will, will uh, be doing their own thing. And you'll have a, a dissociation effectively of activity. So we asked if that was indeed the case. This is the key part on the previous slide just here so you can look at it. And we did the equivalent of stereo EEG that, that we did for the patients, but now in the mouse, we put in neuropixels recording electrodes. These are high density. You can collect thousands of neurons, uh, activity of thousands of neurons. And we saw indeed an amazing thing. This is a correlation plot. Left is off ketamine. On the right is post ketamine or on ketamine. And red means correlated. Blue means anti-correlated. And listening in all across the brain, we saw indeed that the AV and LD, the regions that are tightly wired to retrosplanar cortex, were, as shown in red, in sync with retrosplanial. But AM, the region that the, the thalamic region that was, showed up as blue in this plot, it became out of sync. And you can see that directly in the raw data. At the top, AM uh, in magenta and retrosplenial in green, you can see they're forced out of sync, out of rhythm uh, by this process. And so now what you've got is a whole part of the brain in one rhythm, a whole part of the brain forced in an inverse correlation. And this gives us an immediate way to begin to understand uh, this very mysterious, uh, complex state of dissociation anchored in real clinical understanding uh, from the point of view of retrosplenial thalamic dynamics. And I'll wrap up in just a few slides here. I, I, I'm very happy to have been able to, to share this perspective. And it's really important to think about how uh, we should be fearless in, in approaching these important questions that are, that are vital to our lives and the lives of so many people that we care about, that we treat, and friends and family. Um, and there is hope. These things are accessible. The most complex and mysterious things we can now access in rigorous causal and, and quantitative ways. And I'll share a funny story. I was uh, I spoke with the uh, Royal College of Psychiatry not long ago, and and these connections uh, and and my own patient experiences uh, I've been able to collect recently in a book. Uh, it's coming out in a month or so called Projections, where some of the patients' uh, experiences and the neuroscience insights are all uh, uh, brought together and in, uh, in a way that can be seen at once. What was interesting though is that the word projections, which captures so much of the mechanism, you know, the projections from thalamus to retrosplenal cortex and back again. Of course, projections has a deep meaning in psychiatry. It uh, is a, uh, also is, is a way that we think about revealing what lies within, what lies hidden within in general. Those connotations don't always uh, translate uh, fully to other languages. This is the Dutch version where we had to use insight instead of uh, uh, projections. But what was even more surprising is the, the UK version. Uh, also, apparently I had to translate from English to English as well. They, they preferred to use connections instead of projections. So don't be confused if you see uh, connections. It's the same book. I didn't write uh, three books at once, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy it. And one of the uh, perspectives here is that how far we do come in linking these very complex, mysterious, and important states that we all think about and care about and how our understanding is now anchored in this most basic uh, rigorous biology, x-ray crystal, crystal structures of these microbial ion channels. And I think this is a, a story that is important for all of us to know, for the lay public to know, uh, and for, for leaders of society to know, so they understand the value of, of science in, in helping uh, the patients in, in our communities. So I'll wrap up there. I'm deeply grateful to all my colleagues and collaborators. Uh, their uh, names uh, are reflected here and, and mentioned earlier. The folks who led the dissociation work, uh, Asam Vasuna, Isaac Kovar, uh, Ethan Richman, uh, Felicity Gore, and others, and uh, all our funding agencies. We have an amazing team, um, but we have a long way to go. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions uh, or thoughts now or, or afterward as well. Um, and I think I'll wrap up there if there's time for questions. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Carl, for a really fascinating whistle-stop tour of, um, you know, uh, helping us understand neurobiologically some really complex aspects of um, uh, mental health experience. Um, I, I'm really excited to see the, the, the ketamine work. Um, as as uh, many people know, this is a really uh, exciting area of development and being applied um, to our understanding of um, depression and showing that we can actually get get some really um, profound uh, effects on mental health status through the application of, of, of ketamine. Um, I, I guess a beautiful aspect to me of, of that talk is really the way in which you've just been able to pull the circuit apart and show these dissociations and really get a very a very thorough understanding of of what's happening. But I, I guess as you hint at, it, it prompts a whole lot more questions in terms of understanding what are, what are the natures of the causes of these oscillatory activities? Why are we seeing um, these behaviors in particular groups of patients? How might we then go on to, um, in, go on to intervene and create um, ways of helping those individuals um, get away from um, dissociations which can be really um, uh, all encompassing in people's lives? Um, so for me, really exciting. Thank you so much, um, and I guess a, lo a lot more questions to a lot more questions to address. Kendall, thank you, Andrew. What a fascinating discussion to be having during Mental Health Awareness Week, and I'll offer a couple of thoughts from a lived experience perspective. So. I know when I was initially depressed with major depressive disorder and some anxiety that came with that, felt quite blindsided and it was really overwhelming. And being able to have that psychoeducation around what was going on was something that really did reduce stigma and, and helped me to go on my journey to figure out how to navigate this. And it's so heartwarming to know that you have these ferociously curious scientists and practitioners in your corner looking into these things on an ongoing basis. And I think a couple of things that you touched on early on, Carl, reducing stigma, helping people understand themselves and others. And Andrew, you touched on making the complex simple. All of those things I think are really impactful when, when you navigate a, a mental health journey. So thank you very much, Carl. Thank you. Yeah, I can say a lot more on all your points. Very perceptive from both of you. Um, I don't know if I should now, or should we see questions from the group uh, either way? So we, we've had one come one come through that is just really excited about um, the talk um, and uh, bringing together clinical in insight with biological innovation. Um, and so this is a, a general question about tips for early career researchers. And I guess that's one of the big opportunities of this tremendous event of bringing together all of these different perspectives. So do you have any particular tips about how you integrate that clinical and um, the kind of biological perspectives together. Um, and uh, yeah, what are your reflections on that, Carl? Yeah, this is something that uh, people who are interested both in research and in seeing patients really have to solve uh, because both, of course, are, are full-time jobs in, in some sense. And it's important to structure one's career so they uh, have at least some synergy where they're pulling you in the same direction uh, and, and where they seem to help each other. If you don't have that uh, apparent synergy, it's, life will become difficult. You'll feel pulled away from one by the other and vice versa. And, and so that's very important. Try to figure out ways in which you can make them uh, pull in the same direction. Um, and for me, also, I, I, I see patients, you know, half day a week. I do some inpatient work uh, for a week, a year. It's really, it's not a lot, but it's very important. And for me, it's, those are some of my favorite times. I feel refreshed, I feel invigorated. It's part of my identity is to, to help people and I feel complete and whole when I'm doing it. Uh, but then most of the time is, is in labor, the laboratory, which is exciting and, and fulfilling as well. And so the other advice is just to appreciate each mode you're in uh, while you're in it, appreciate it for what it is, for what it, it, it means to you. Um, but, uh, and the final thing would just to be, you know, just to uh, don't don't be afraid of of complexity. Don't be afraid of mystery. Uh, that's where the biggest opportunities are. And mental health has some of the biggest mysteries out there. Ken, we can't hear you right now. 
Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking now. Uh, I can address some of your questions, Andrew, from earlier, or Kendall. Yeah, I'd, I, I'd be fascinated to hear. I hope others would be too. Okay. You, you raised some very interesting questions uh, re regarding the, uh, you know, why dissociation? Why does it happen? Uh, why does this rhythm appear? These are things we don't have the answer to, but it appears highly conserved. You know, the, the fact that this can happen so potently, it happens in the mouse, it happens in people through a similar mechanism, it suggests it's an ancestral state, that it's likely uh, in some form, in some way, has or had adaptive value, useful uh, uh, significance. And if you think about it, separation of oneself from active experience is actually, in some cases, pretty important. It's a pretty important adaptive strategy. There are cases of severe pain syndromes or cases of uh, severe stress, which is, by the way, where dissociation shows up. So that's another clue uh, where it actually, as you could readily understand, may help in, in getting through a difficult time and allowing survival uh, until the uh, traumatic or stressful or, or, or painful experience is passed. I, I think that this is, it's, it's accessing a natural and adaptive process, like so much in psychiatry, can become maladaptive, can become extreme, and, and, and cause challenges. Retrosplenial cortex is, is ancient, it's conserved, all mammals have some retrosplenial cortex, and I think this is a, a, a mechanism that was discovered uh, uh, by evolution uh, to have some adaptive value. And, and uh, you know, how can we turn this into helping people? Uh, you know, if people do, it, experience, as many people do, intrusive, invasive, uh, debilitating dissociation. I've, I've heard, you know, communications from patients who describe it as an incredibly disruptive thing that makes them feel uh, completely unconnected to all parts of their lives, to other people, to emotions, uh, to meaning, and it can be a very, very maladaptive state. Now that we uh, have a handle on regional and molecular and cellular mechanisms, one could easily imagine using this causal knowledge that optogenetics gives us. We know now it's causally involved. It's not just a correlation. We can now come in and think about designing medications that target this pacemaker ion channel, for example, uh, or that because retrosplenal cortex is on the surface of the brain, uh, we could en envisage brain stimulation treatments that access and influence this rhythm as well. So I think we have armed with this causal knowledge, uh, it, it, it comes a long way for us, of course. I don't know exactly what kind of therapy uh, yet might help, but it gives us a foundation to, to, to launch from. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Carl, personally, and on behalf of everyone joining us today. We are going to go ahead and transfer back over to Lee. Thank you.